And we are live. Welcome one and all to JWC, Joe's Writers Club. This is our live stream, JWC live stream. Uh, this is what we call JWC live stream. This is Story Autopsy with Ricky and Tom and special guest Amber Danson. Um, we've been having so much fun the last couple of weeks talking about stuff and doing reads. And today we're going to do pretty similar. We're going to have a pretty similar situation. We got some reads and we're going to talk about author blogging. Should authors blog? And what is, what is your, what is your stance on that? Uh, so that'll be later on in the show. But in the meanwhile, uh, how are we today? Tom, how you doing? Amber, how are you? Quite excellent. Mm. That's good to hear. Mm. Yeah. No, I get it. Uh, it's an all right kind of uh, atmosphere sometimes. Um, how, how have you guys been creatively? Have you been working on anything? Amber, you first. I've been, I've been mostly editing. Uh, I have made a couple connections with people who are going to read for me, though. Hmm. Oh, be beta readers? Yeah. Very, very important thing to... Uh, it's one of the things we always do at JWC during our Tuesday meetings. Uh, 7 to 9 Eastern Time. Sign up at uh, uh, joeswriters.club. Uh, we, we have... Uh, it's basically you show up with your latest creative work, your creative obsession, and you read them out loud because you want people to read your stuff and you want to be able to read your stuff and read it with confidence. Hmm. Uh, at least I've always been a big believer in that. All the greats did that, the beatniks, the inklings, all these writers movements that, that brought us so much. They used to read it because it's an antiquarian thing to read your stuff, to get together and read poetry or whatever. Um, but beta readers are crucial for the industry, you know, to refine your product. So that that sounds like good news, uh, Amber. Um, so editing. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Tom, how about you? What, what have you been working on? I've been doing a little bit of work on the the, the bride and her mate. Um, I also started doing a master list of all the stories that I have, and I've done I'm dividing it into um, elevator pitch, and then another one file with a little more detail. And, that is uh, an that is an excellent idea, Tom. <laughs> just just to, yeah, I didn't realize I had so much stuff, you know. 37 short stories alone <laughs> that yeah. are part of a series. No, I know. And, and that's how you are. You got, you got piles of stuff. I know Amber's the same way. She's got notebooks brimming over. And making lists like that and staying on top of it is really, really good for, for the writer uh, because it gives you a sense of like, when you take inventory of all your works, it gives you a sense of, wow, I am getting somewhere, you know, because you read about how all the greats wrote this many stories and endless letters and, you know, it, it's great that you're doing that. I, I made a similar list, I'd say, about six months ago where I was gathering all my stuff from the four winds, you know, right. making sure that it was all. But you're taking it another step. You're you're. Um, you're saying, well, I'm going to do elevator pitch and I'm imagining you're going to do all that stuff for 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 any project you think you're going to want to sell. Right. Sure. And also um, with each book collection, I, I think of doing like a, you know, a little introduction for the short story collection, let's say. And mm -hmm. um, it won't hurt to have an idea what these stories are before. Well, I'm not going to forget them, but uh, just to have them, it'd be uh it's very, very cool. No, yeah, that, it's a great idea um, for all those reasons that we just talked about. Uh, that, that's good. Um, <clears throat> I've been working on, um, I've been outlining occasionally for some projects that I'm going to start soon. Um, but I've been working on book blurbs for my book of Mass Ross series. Hmm. Um, and uh, they're, they're in edit right now 
and I'm talking to the cover artist and everything else. It's very exciting, you know, um, cause that, that series is dear to me. Uh, we already got one of them up on Kindle, thankfully, but I want to put them all up as soon as possible, you know? Um, right. Yeah, it's it's really great working on that stuff. I mean, I'm not an especial fan of writing book blurbs because I really feel like I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I I don't ever know if I know what I'm doing, you know, because right. my 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 tastes in what is alluring. Like when I'm when I'm in a bookstore in that rare occasion, because it's like they're almost anachronistic at this point. Um, mm -hmm. But it's like when I'm in a bookstore and I'm shopping shelves and I, I read the back, my tastes of what's cool and what isn't are like, they're not typical. So, mm. and, and my book is not typical. Like it's a weird genre. Cover art is like, oh, cosmic fantasy. I've never heard of that before. I'm like, yeah, well, that's, I'm weird, man. I don't know what to say. So mm. it, it's, it's like, it's all about that, you know, um, lately is, is book blurbs. Um, a, wor but I, a word about I, that, though. It's, a, it's become a necessary evil, especially if you're in the self-publishing um, world. You've got to also be, become very, very good now at doing blurbs, do very, very good at uh, doing elevator pitch, you know, the, the, yeah, sure. the one sentence. Yep. Rather than having someone else do it for you like the old days. Uh, no more. Not, no, not everybody's got it in them. Um, but I really feel like it's something to reach for because blur, blurbs make me antsy, uh, because they're, they're like, they're, they're as important as the cover. Like the cover is the distant evaluation for the book. They always say, well, you can't judge a book by its cover, but mm. these days you do. When you're talking about actual books, <laughs> they they do judge you by your cover maybe mm -hmm. they're the nicest person in the world they're not going to judge you personally in the metaphoric sense by it but you got to have a cool cover and and therefore the next thing your blurb can't be nonsense you know it's got to be true. it's got to be tight because that's almost the second criteria oh cool cover now i'm walking up i'm, I'm looking at the book and now i'm like oh yeah this this sounds cool and now i'm gonna buy it or i'm not so you know that's the thing. Um, I don't know, Tom, maybe if you want to take a look at Adam, if you have time this week, maybe after they're edited. Um, cause, I'd be glad uh, to. Yeah, because we, we, that's something at JWC we definitely want to focus on um, mm. is, hel is helping people with that. Um, Amber, how do you feel about blurbs? Oh, they're a real pain in the butt, but once you get them right, <laughs> that's what sells your book. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, yeah, no, it, it's it's important. That's why I've been that's why I've been focusing on it. Um, so yeah, we're gonna have some other cool stuff to talk about too. But I want to get on to the read. Um, a Amber, both you and Tom, I think, have something to read today. What are you gonna read for us? It's called Through the Desert. It's a little bit of the crime fiction piece I wrote. Mm, cool. Uh, that sounds great. So whenever you're ready, let's let's hear it. I'm sure every, all of our uh, viewers want to check it out. I know I do. Uh, your reads are great. The desert air grew colder as midnight approached and the land surrendered the last of its heat to the night sky. Bits of the scrub brush which dotted the landscape tore at the girl's skin whenever she stumbled into one of them. No other creatures stirred nearby, though she could hear coyotes howling in the distance. She stopped running, not because she felt safe, but because she was near the end of her strength. After that first burst of desperate speed, she dropped into a walk only when the stitch in her side and the burn in her lungs demanded a rest. In the trackless desert, there was no telling where she was or which way she was going. The moon was barely a sliver, and 13-year-old Jane knew too little about the stars to find her direction that way. She had left the narrow desert road behind along with him. Her feet were starting to bleed, little red smears left behind with every step she took. Pain, yes, there was pain, 
but her terror almost blotted it out. She didn't feel the wheels and scratches left behind by the brush, didn't feel the bruises on her face and body. Shivering, she skirted a tumble of rocks and headed toward a distant sound of water. It might have been better if she had at least grabbed her shirt before she ran, but she hadn't wanted to waste what might be her only chance. Mr. Harold had looked away for a moment when he left her weeping and violated on the desert floor, had turned his back on her when he grabbed his pants. Terrified submission had turned into headlong flight in an instant. He had found her once. He could find her again. Mr. Harold knew the desert better than she did. She expected to hear him behind her at any moment, expected to feel those rough hands on her. If he caught her, he would kill her, because she knew his face. She knew his car. She knew his address. He was her neighbor. She had trusted him. She wished, he knew, she wished she knew how long he had been watching her, following her, gaining her trust only to betray her in the worst possible way. She never would have gotten in the car with him if she hadn't believed he was harmless. Far from harmless. Mr. Harold was the, police, was the man the police had been searching for these past five years. He was the reason women in the area locked their doors and looked at unknown men with suspicion. He was the desert coyote. None of the ten women he had assaulted survived the experience. Jane was desperate to become the first, but she needed to reach help before she died of exposure or, or before he caught up with her. Stumbling in her haze of fear and pain, she didn't notice when the sound of water grew louder. Her bloody foot slipped on one of the slick stones and she found herself on her butt, jarred from neck to tailbone. There was a thin thread of water trickling through the desert. Not something that would survive the next dry spell, but one of those tiny streams which ran for a short time after a rainstorm. Not even deep enough for her to cup any water out. Since she was already on the ground, she threw herself onto her stomach and put her face in the water. It tasted of minerals and mud, but she drank until she could hold no more. She would need the water in case she was still in the desert when the sun rose. Should she stay by the stream, hoping to follow it to civilization, or would he look for her here? There were no lights on the horizon, nothing to tell her that she was anywhere near settled areas. Jane had no idea how big the desert was or how deep into it he had taken her. She had tried to pay attention while he drove, but her fear and the violent assault afterward made her memories fuzzy. Water always led somewhere eventually, and her best hope of survival lay in staying near the water. She pushed herself to her feet. No reason to choose one direction over the other. She started off downstream. Every now and then, when the going was level, she would walk in the stream itself. The cold water helped her ignore the pain in her swollen, abused feet. The approach of dawn turned the darkness into shades of gray. Walking became mechanical and her mind went numb. It wasn't until her feet touched asphalt that she realized she had found a road. Wandering through the desert left her with no idea which way to go in order to put more distance between herself and the man who had raped her. Nothing on the road in indicated direction, but it was wide enough to be one of those little country highways. Two lanes, the yellow lines barely visible in the growing light. Jane turned and started walking along the shoulder. She walked until she stumbled and went down. The fresh pain of her scraped knee sliced through the old pain. She tried to rise and failed, scraping her palms when she tumbled to the ground. Her vision went gray. She fought, but unconsciousness pulled her over, under. The sound of a car whooshing past slammed her back into herself in rough chunks. She jerked and managed to raise herself up enough to see the vehicle slow down. The backup lights flashed. The car moved closer. It pulled up a few yards away and the drive driver hurried toward her. A man, but not him. She began to cry, relief and fear at war inside her. When the man hurried up to her, she cowered and tried to stand. But this man didn't hurt her. He stripped off his shirt and gave it to her. She heard the concern in his voice, but couldn't focus enough to understand what he was saying. Dan. His name was Dan. He helped her to her feet and put his arm around her shoulders. She let him guide her to his car let him help her into the passenger seat, but she couldn't stop crying. They drove a while, and the memories of her last drive made her shake. 
Dan talked to her, his voice gentle, until they pulled up in front of a hospital. Nurses and electrodes and a hospital gown. Then a bed and a blanket, but she couldn't stop shaking. The medicine they gave her made her float, nicely distant from the pain of her throbbing feet. It hurt worse to clean them than it had to walk on them. The cops arrived before Jane's parents did. She cringed when she saw the male detective. With a word to his female partner, he left the room but stood just outside. He won't let anyone hurt you. The lady detective's voice was gentle. Can you tell me what happened? Tears coursed down Jane's face. I was walking home from school and Mr. Harold saw me. He said he would give me a ride home. He only lives next door. I thought I could trust him. I'm sorry. You don't have to be sorry, sweetheart. The lady detective took Jane's hand. You know the man who attacked you? Jane nodded. He's the desert coyote. He told me so. He bragged while he was, while he, it's okay, take your time. Jane took a deep breath and wiped her face. Where's my mom? The nurse told me that your mother is on the way. Do you want to wait until she's here before we talk? Jane shook her head. No, this will be easier to say when she's not here. The lady detective took out a pen and a pad of paper from inside her long jacket. Take your time. When I got into Mr. Harold's car, he drove past my house. When I got scared, he took out a gun and told me he wouldn't hurt me as long as I kept quiet. Jane wrapped her arms around herself. So I kept quiet. I let him take me into the desert, and I know I shouldn't have. I know I, I should have fought. The lady detective squeezed Jane's hand. This is not your fault. Nothing that happened to you is your fault. Jane sniffled. When he stopped, he told me to get out of the car and take my clothes off, and I did what he told me. But he hit me anyway. He put the gun on the seat of the car and beat me and forced himself on me. When, he had a, when I had a chance to run, I ran. You did the right thing, Jane. It's okay. It's over now. Jane's tangled hair whipped her face when she shook her head. It's not over. I still have to testify. I want him to go away forever. I don't want him to hurt anyone else like he hurt me. The lady detective made a few notes. You're a brave young lady. Can you tell me Mr. Harold's address? With what you've told me, we can arrest him right now, especially if you're willing to let the nurse examine you. We can take pictures of your bruises and get DNA evidence. Do you know what DNA is? Yes. The lady detective looked relieved. Good. If we can get some DNA, we'll be able to lock him up for a long time. The tension slowly drained from Jane's body. The satisfying thought of seeing Mr. Harold behind bars carried her through the nurse's examination. It was absurd to feel humiliated, but she couldn't help it. When it was over, her mother came into the room. My baby! Not a baby anymore, Jane thought sadly, but it felt so good to see her mother that she didn't say it. Jane, Mom threw her arms around Jane, and for a moment, Jane felt like she did when she was little and would run to her mother for comfort after a nightmare. Now she knew that some nightmares are real, and her mother's embrace could not cure everything. Yet with those arms tied around her, at least Jane no longer felt alone. Oof, Amber dancing there. Wow, that is that is a heck of a trip, man. Um, <clears throat> you got your bloody footprints and your it's like a delirium in the desert and just all that stuff. Heavy, heavy duty. Um, brutal. I mean, very well, very well written where it's like you're you're right there. Um, the metaphysical and uh, biological um, horror of all of that is very, very present. Um, I mean, and it's it's incredible. What what did you think, Tom? Uh, hair raising, also. Yeah, yeah, um, the ten yeah, the tension. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, I kept wanting her to find a place to hide. <laughs> no, you know, yeah, a good no, place no to doubt. hide. So. Yeah, no doubt about it. Powerful stuff, um, Amber. Thank you for reading. Um. <clears throat> so, Tom, how about you? 
what are we looking at? You're going to continue your from or you're going to continue on from last week? Yes, we'll do part two of uh, a taste a, a taste of your blood. There All right. Go. Sounds All good. Right. Where we left them off, we uh, she's uh, this creature, this woman is um, what do you call it? Uh, in John Pencrum's living room, and he's come home from a bad day, and the first thing he sees when he sees her tells her, "You should be dead." And she she says, "I'm very hard to kill." So he has killed her so far ten times over the course of two decades and uh, she just won't stay down so I have here you're running out of ways to kill me John one day no method you try will work what then I'll deal with it if it ever happens for now I want you to leave really and we were having such a nice chat she stood behind her the the chair clicked she turned her head a net fell upon her tiny barbs touched her skin and stuck fast she couldn't move what is this I was never sure you were truly dead in Malta I've had all of these years to find out what you truly are all right I'll bite what I what am I in the first place your name is Faye Danan the sovereign of blood you are a third tier vampire a feeder your strength is drawn from the blood itself, not from the nutrition in the blood. You cannot know such things, she said. I must get to. To what? Or should I say, to who? Fadenan said nothing. Grunda is here, isn't it? Said, asked John. What if he is? She said with a smile. He's hungry, and there should be plenty to feed on here at the vineyard. John took out his phone and dialed. Bert, I need your help at the main house. Is there a picnic, sir? asked Bert. Yes, you know what has to be done. I'll wait for you here. You look worried, John. Faith and Anne struggled to get free of the net. It held her fast. The door opened, and the tall figure of Bertram Singh entered the room. As head of security for the vineyard, he reported directly to John and Haley Pencrum. In his hand, a knife of the same metal as the barbs glinted in the light. Your mother and the staff are in place, sir, asked Bert, said Bert. Shall I get Miranda? John shook his head. No, I'll take her to the circle. Don't let her move. She has her familiar on the grounds. Be careful. If it's Grunda, it could take on any form. I'll be ready for it. Have Malachi meet me at the door, side door of the house. He'll need the iron halberd. I'll call him right now. Thank you. Pencrum moved down the hall and found Miranda unconscious on the floor of their bedroom. He picked her up and carried her to the back door leading to the rear of the house. The door opened. Malachi Warner nodded to John. He held the ancient halberd in both hands. Blood dripped from its tip. The creature came between the two houses, Mr. Pencrum, said Malachi. I sliced off one of its limbs, and it ran off. We'll have time to get the misses into the circle. Good work, Malachi, said John. Does Mother have the herbal chest? Yes, I saw her with it. Have her try the bottle called anti-hypnosis. It may just bring Miranda around. They approached the circle of standing stones. At 27 feet in diameter, it held charms and spells to ward off any known evil entity or enchantment. John laid Miranda on the center altar. Haley Pencrum stood by her side as John turned and rushed off. John, is there anything I could do? Mrs. Pencrum shouted. Malachi has the directions I gave him, shouted John. John grabbed one of the lit torches at the circle's edge as he saw Grunda approaching. His eyebrows hunched up as he tried to make out what the being looked like this time. A pickup truck drove into view, smashing into the figure of Grunda. The creature flew into a dozen into dozens of pieces as Amos brought the vehicle vehicle to a halt. Amos backed his truck and pulled it to close to the stone circle. What was it that I just hit? We have no time to stand around, said John. Come on with me. He pulled the torch back into one of its stanchions. John left the d truck parked where it was and joined John as he walked back to the main house. Both of them entered to find Faye Danan in the same spot as he left her. Bert nodded to Pentram. She's not much of a talker, said Bert. 
Not to you, she said. She'll only speak to her equals or someone who has killed her. That leaves me out, said Bert. I'll go join Mrs. Pentgram in the circle. Let me know if you need my assistance any more. I'll let you know, said John, and thank you for the quick response. That's my job, sir, said Bert. Amos, let me introduce you to Faye Danan, said John. She hails from a land long gone from history. I've traced her back to an island off the coast of Ireland about 12,000 B.C. About that time there occurred a great catastrophe that affected every coastline on the Atlantic Ocean. Many ancient tribes were wiped out on both sides of the ocean. Did she have anything to do with it? asked Amos. No, not as far as I could discover. She and several others were the only ones who survived the disaster that destroyed the island. Sounds like Atlantis. You could be right, said John. The dates add up with Plato. Ha! That fool Plato, said Phaedonan. He couldn't find his own city on a map. Atlantis is a myth we created to keep you humans from looking for our homeland under the sea. Why? asked John. What would we find there? You'll have to go and look for yourself, she said. I may just do that. John extended his hand toward Faye Dinan. Amos McConnell, meet the only the third tier vampire I've ever met. A feeder, said Amos. No kidding. Where has she been all this time? She wound up in Britain, where she ruled the Picts and a half a dozen other tribes in those islands. They worshipped her, and she fed upon them for a hundred, a hundred centuries. Her most famous identity is Morgan Le Fay. I see. How did you meet her? Twenty-three, cent, twenty-three years ago, on the Maya island of Minos, suffered a, a rash of horrific slayings of young children. The government of Greece called me for help. I found her with a dozen young girls in a cave. That was the first time I killed her. John looked at Amos looked at John. The first time? She's tough to kill, as it turns out. I tried all of the vampire slaying techniques that I could get my hands on. Nothing worked until the last time in Malta. She be, we beheaded her and buried her and her body in separate places in the tomb of a Catholic saint. It worked until some fools broke open the tomb to dis and disturbed her. And here she stands before us. Very impressive, John, said, said Faye Danan. She looked down at the net that held her. What is this netting made of? It is net. The net is made from devil's hemp, a rare plant that only grows deep in the Amazon. The barbs are made from metal from the Hudson's Bay meteor crater, the material used by your enemy to contain your kind. Her face changed dramatically. You couldn't know about that, she said. Then it's true. There's more than iron and nickel, that net metal, and you don't like it. That's why I changed my strategy in dealing with your kind. I don't understand, she said, weakly struggling in the webbing. Let me keep it short, and then I'll... Go, I'm going to change out of these wet clothes. An old tome from the city of Ur stated that your kind could not ever be killed, but they could be held. Nothing can hold me long. John smiled. You think so? I've learned a lot in those years since Malta, like this. He went into the kitchen. When he came back, he held a garlic, garlic clove in his hand. This is very powerful, but it's been used wrong in the books and in the movies. She smiled. I have no fear of that. Garlic cannot hurt me. No, that's true, but it can do this. He touched the blade of the meteor dagger to the flesh at her neck. She groaned and opened her mouth to scream. The garlic clove went into her mouth. She stopped struggling and stared at John with hate. She sank to the ground as John applied pressure to her shoulders. He lay her down next to a large bookcase. She could no longer move or speak. You'll find it more comfortable here, said John. In the morning... We'll find a place to keep you. We'll have no more late-night visits from you. Good night. John led Amos outside, where Grunda had nearly reassembled itself. Tell me about this thing on the lawn, said Amos. It's called Grunda. I don't know what it really is. All I know is that it's a co companion or familiar of Faye Dinan. Wherever she goes, it shows up. It's more than a distraction and less of a menace. What's it made of? That's an amazing thing about Grunda, John began. Grunda comes into our world from wherever it lives when not with Faye Danan. It creates a new corp corporal version of itself from wherever mat organic materials it can scrounge up when it gets here. Right now it looks like a grass-covered mass of cardboard boxes. Yes, and that's why I grabbed the torch. Maybe it'll burn up and we'll be rid of it for the night. 
Come on, let's give it a try. John and Amos grabbed torches and stood with Grunda between them. Grunda began to growl. It tried to move toward the stone circle, but John stood in the way. As Grunda faced John and threatened him with a deep growl, Amos crept up to the ever-growing creature. At the moment, its bulk matched that of the pickup truck. Amos touched the tip of his torch to the back of Grunda. A tail sprouted from under the grassy hide of the creature, lashing out and knocking Amos to the ground. Grunda turned to move toward Amos, who crawled backward until he could get to his feet. Grunda's head swelled, looking now like that of an ankylosaurus with spikes sprouting from its head. Amos held his torch in front of him, keeping the entity away. The back of Grunda began to burn with a green and violet fire. The burning multiplied as the card, dried cardboard began to catch de fire deep within, deep inside of Grunda. The beast howled in pain, looking up toward the darkening sky. John ran to one side and set the spiked cage ablaze, spiked edge ablaze. Now Grunda stopped moving. It howled long and loud, collapsing into a heap. The pile of grass and cardboard burned with lots of smoke as Grunda's essence left this dimension. John turned and saw Miranda standing at the edge of the circle. He stepped into the ring and embraced her. How are you feeling? he asked. I'm fine now, she said. I don't recall anything. I came into the bedroom from the closet and woke up here with your mother. I'm glad you're all right. Thank you, mother. That's some adventure you had, John, said George. What did you do with the vampire? That's something that I can can or that's not something I can or will divulge to anyone divulge to anyone. Let's just say she'll not be bothering anyone for at least two or three more centuries. Wow, that's an incredible life you live. We're just about out of time. I'd like to thank my good friend John Pencrum for stopping by. John, it's been a real treat. It's been a pleasure, George. Promise me you'll come back. Just call me. I can always make time for a candle in the dark. You heard it here, folks. After we come back, we'll dive into the mysteries of Lake Champlain. Has Champ been spotted again? <clears throat> so. Tom, Tom Tiernan. Um, I love a good John Pankram story. Uh, there's so much going on beyond the voice. John Pankram's got a great paradigm that he takes place in. Um, and the way that you do your breakdown of stuff, like this is a paradigm that focuses around paranormal hunters. Uh, you know, he's the kind of guy who could have a vampire waiting in his living room for him out of some kind of vendetta. Um, you talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the nature of immortality, like the way that you slip it in. You know, the alchemy that's on display um, and all these different details uh, that are in there. It's the industrial terminology of a of a demon hunter. You know, um, it's like being in the mind of Van Helsink or something, you know, hmm. um, fantastic. Uh, and he's got his own Stonehenge on on the grounds, which I thought I, I thought was pretty interesting. Uh... You know, absolutely. Uh, it's any been there forever. Of... The, the stone circle's been sitting there for a hundred thousand years or whatever. So, and, and what's he, more, he knows about it. He built the whole his whole property, the vineyard and the grounds around that circle. So, right on, right on. Amber, what'd you think of that read? That was very gripping. I was glad we got a chance to finish it. Yeah, right on, man. Um, he's got a bunch. How many of those Pankram stories you got, Tom? Oh, written about six of them. I'm going to put those together into a collection, and I have a lot more. I have about 40, 50 um, uh, titles, and most, and they're plotted out. So, um, you know, it's just a matter of uh, getting to them, you know. Um, Absolutely, man. Those are not to be passed over. Not, not at all. Um, and you got to get that collection together. We got to step on the gas with that, man. Um, that's great. Thanks for reading both of you. <clears throat> um, and, and you know, that's the thing you, you guys are, you guys are awesome writers. And I mean, all that stuff is very authentic, very compelling. Both of those tales, 
And it's like, um, well, what, what's next, you know? Uh, so you got to do, you got to have a social media presence if you're going to sell your books. And we're going to go over that next week. But today, the other thing we're going to touch on more prominently is author blogging. Okay. Uh, it, it's been put to me that if you want to be successful in this day and age, you know, but, but it's because of the internet. I mean, back in the day, you just, you, you got pamphlets printed out and you went to your, your uh, heavy duty bookstore, the local one, the creature one that everyone loves. There's, a, there's one in every town, your first bookstore. That's like a magical little private business, you know? Um, and, uh, I remember the one, I think it was pyramid and, um, in the touch in New Jersey. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that one, th- th- that, that's what I'm talking about. Something like that. Um, so it's like, you used to be able to do that kind of foot traffic and show up to brick and mortar or, or, or to open mics until you got found. But nowadays everybody's got you in their pocket. You know, the, the internet's on devices and that's a potential sale. So they say, I've heard it said a lot, uh, when you go researching, well, how do I, how do I sell my books or what do I have to do as an author in this day and age? They say that blogging is very, very important. Um, so just really quick, um, Amber, do you, uh, have you ever blogged? No, actually, I don't, I barely do social media. Well, not barely. I do one social media a whole lot and don't do any other form of social media. No, I know. Cause you're, I know you're busy. You, you do, you do editing and you do you, a lot of writing. I mean, you're, you're, you're very prolific mm-hmm. with words and it's like, that's obviously where the fun and the episodic satisfaction is. Um, yeah, I mean, blogging is certainly not for everyone. I came to it very late. Um, so it's like the way I, the way I always approached blogging uh, was, you know, you, 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 you question the formula, you question the topic, and you question the demographic. Mm. Uh, the, the formula for me is just a word budget, like, because – how I mean, you you know, if it's super long, you got to get a bunch of photos and put them in there. So you got to know like what you're going to need to set this thing up. I, I have some some blogging I did um, because the next thing is is topic. Like, what are you going to blog about? So I was doing one. It was like what? anywhere from a thousand words to like 3000 words on secondary world, um, which is what, what Tolkien, J.R. Tolkien talked about when he's, when he, he has this fairy story, it's essays about fairy stories, which are what he called modern fairy tales. And the concept that the writer creates a secondary world Um, so I was doing that with maps, with fantasy cartography, where I was drawing maps and then I would, uh, describe each region on the map in a blog. So you're kind of like building almost like a campaign setting if it was an RPG book, Mm -hmm. but I, I plotted a Zayoth out doing that. Uh, and I used the blogs to do it, which, uh, cause I can't really think of anything else. Like I, I did some stuff on writing, but my demographic specifically was for the fantasy writer, someone who's got their own world. And it's like, how do you develop each region um, so that you know the world, so that your muse can place your characters therein and and have them have a journey? Um, I strongly recommend that. Uh, you know, and I, I, I would love to go over it with people, but not everybody has the time to draw maps and do all this stuff. So my blogging is weird, uh, honestly. Um, how about you, Tom? Have you ever blogged before? Uh, I've had a history of blogging. Um, I used to just blog about, uh, I had, I had a, a, a blog that I paid for. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. I blogged about uh, 
movies and television and um, and books, and uh, so and I saved all those so I could always re retype those and use them again. Um, let me see. Just to give you an idea, one 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 was uh, the best movie of 2012. I wrote a whole thing about the Avengers. So. How long and, was it? Do you remember? I tried to shoot for 750 words. That's a very good thing so. because uh, blogs, that's the thing with my blogs. My blogs were always too long because of the mm. subject matter. And some people dig long blogs and some people don't. The vast majority of people want a quick little thing, right? like a little wisdom capsule that's going to give them what they want. Maybe they're on break or whatever. Right. So that's cool. So 700 words is a very good length for that. Well, and, your t and, and your topic was best movie of 2012, which I guess was what? What was that? Avengers, you're saying? Yeah. So that was one of the other things I wrote. Um, I wrote about 600 of them before I had to stop. To, you know, I just had to stop. Uh -oh. them. And um, so I, I got pretty good. Now I picked up, I have a, I have a website I'm putting together. An author's website that has its own has a blog included, so I'm going to definitely pick up on that. Uh, do mm. histories of stories. Uh, I have a whole thing about the history of uh, the curious journey of Emily Breck. That when she get that gets uh, cooking, I can blog about that, so people get to know where it came from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, and uh, so I'll, I'll probably shoot for about three to four hundred words for those entries, which is. Short and sweet, you know, and mm, yeah, that's that's cool. Um, yeah, so give blogging some thought, I guess, is the general message. Not everybody likes it, not everybody gets it right away. I know, like I said, I arrived very late to that party, and for me, it was at first, it was an agony to figure out what I was going to do. Um, but I, I think it helped my chapter game a little bit. And I think it helped my whole concept of, um, you know, uh, putting it together as far as a word budget. That's that's mm. what got me into word budgets, because you you got to write a certain amount. And it's got to be tight and it's got to be informative. So, you know, it's um, it's it's a piece of technical writing every time you do it. Now, there is a way that you can blog and eventually get paid for it. There's a, a, a site called Medium. Mm, you can, yeah. That's essentially blogging, and you, uh, if you pay for it, it's a couple bucks a month or whatever, um, mm -hmm. you can build followers. And, and uh, so there are people who make money, pretty good money, five ten thousand 10000 a month blogging Absolutely. on that platform. So yeah, uh, yeah. that's tempting. But you've got to... You've got to put out, you know, you've got to really be prolific. Uh, well, if I yeah, did that, I would, certainly. Yeah, if I did that, I wouldn't do any other writing because, you know, but I don't That's want to. That's the thing. Uh, I'd rather throw a chapter down. That's my problem. I just got to budget my time better. That's all. I got to yeah. get back to it. We have some blogs on uh, joeswritersclub.com. If you guys want to check out what I'm talking about with my secondary world, and I think Tom's got some stuff on there too. So check that out, joeswritersclub.com, um, and then go to the blogging section there. And furthermore, um, if you sign up at joeswriters.club, which is our forum at JWC, uh, our, 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 we have a workshop in there uh, for blogging for SEO. It's the blogging for SEO workshop. So go to joeswriters.club and check that out. You could sign up for it. And uh, it's actually a really cool workshop that TC runs. And it's going to help you figure out how to blog for SEO. And it'll be, I mean, it doubles for a, just a general blogging situation. He's going he's gonna to show you soup to nuts what it's all about. Sure. So I would definitely check that out, joeswriters.club. We got a great community at JWC. There's a lot of potential. Uh, come and join us uh, with your creative obsessions or come to learn, whatever it is. Um, so all good things, right? We had a great show today. We talked about lots of cool stuff. And the read was, was awesome. Um, 
both of those were like really gripping stories. Uh, so it's plug time. Amber Danson, why don't you, uh, what, what do you have to plug uh, for us today? I still have only Death's Nightmare out. And uh, um, anybody who's interested in starting a new series, I'll be launching the sequel on October 1st. So you can get it for sale right now while Amazon's running their sale. And then in October, you'll have a new one to read. Very nice. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great book. It's, it's, uh, go and check it out. That's on Amazon, right? Right. Very good. Thank you. Tom, your plug. Yes, uh, my book is on Amazon uh, Kindle right now. It's uh, Dwellers in the Shadows. Uh, you'll find it, you'll see, uh, there's a few books of similar title. Look for the one with the spider's web on it and the spider. Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll be it. Fantastic. Yeah, you guys want to check that out. You heard how he is with short stories. Come on now. Uh, go, go pick it up. Um, <clears throat> I am selling uh, through JWC and on Amazon.com. I'm selling my cyberpunk novel, Babeltron. Well, it's a novella, um, but people have been checking it out and saying it's a real page turner. Uh, so that's Babeltron after the fire. On Amazon.com, Richard Andrew Olkus is is my name, my author name, and uh, go check it out. Uh, we're we're creative obsessors, all of us. We all really work to try to make a unique product. Um, and you heard how tasty it is on this because uh, these guys, when they read it, it's like forget it, you know. Uh, an amazing, amazing, am amazing material. And uh, that's going to be it for us. Um, thanks a lot for reading, both of you, and coming on the show again. And uh, it was a blast, like always. We'll see you next week, all right? Sure. Bye, Have a good night. We'll see you next week.